today as we dive in too deep with myself and Neil Driscoll. If you could add one free agent to the Miami Dolphins, who would it be? Also, NFL rival scouts believe the Miami Dolphins are targeting the offensive line in round one. So, you know, me and Neil, we're going to talk about that because we've been talking about it all year. Uh, is Mike McDaniel interested in a wide receiver from Yale, just like himself? We'll talk about that. Also, how Edge seems to be a priority through the draft process. We got tons to talk about. Do me the favor. Smash the like button. Subscribe if you're new and you already know what time it is. Let's get into this. <laughs> Listening to Finn Too Deep. To a back to throw. Blitz coming. They get to him. No, he takes off running. And he's in. Touchdown, Miami. With the sixth pick in the 2021 NFL Draft, the Miami Dolphins select Jalen Waddle. Giving you unfiltered, informed, and controversial takes on the Miami Dolphins and the NFL Draft. Here's Reason and Neil. What is good, Finn Nation? What's good? It's your boy, Reason. We're back here for another one. I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Neil Driscoll, as we dive Finn too deep. And we are exactly two weeks away from round one of the NFL draft. Exciting times ahead. Shout out to Rhino Sith. He donates $5. He also donated $5 after the fact yesterday on yesterday's show. He said probably won't be around but thanks for the hard work, Reason and Neil. And shout out to Brandon Little. He became a YouTube member. So, man, a lot a lot coming up, a lot on the horizon. As you guys will remember, my next big board coming out for all of you guys is going to be safety. And then we are going to wrap up with guard. If you haven't had a chance to check out the latest, go check it out. It was offensive tackle, and we dropped that on Monday. So, we got a lot to talk about. Neil, how are you feeling only two weeks removed from the NFL draft right now? Yeah, man, honestly, it, and good to hear everyone out there listening to us. And sorry, I'm not on camera today. But, uh, you know, I, it's my it's one of my least favorite parts of the year. Because, first of all, you know, the anxiety of, you know, two weeks away, you're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting. And it's also, I think, the time of the year where, so much information is out there that you don't know what is real, right? Like this is when they say it's lying season, you know, you're going to see the dolphins are interested in every prospect under the moon this week and next week and leading up to it. And, and, you know, I, I feel like it's always, you know, it, it's always that time of year where there's, it seems like there's always a big trade that happens right around the eve of the draft. And, and, and you know, will this year be different? You know, I know there's three or four teams trying to get up in that top five, to get, you know, whether it's McCarthy or May, the quarterback that falls. But, you know, we're only two third, you know, two weeks away at this point. Uh, and, you know, we've been talking about the draft all year and and this draft class is exciting. And um I, I can't wait to see who the Dolphins add. Yeah, I either 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 can I, man. We got a lot, a lot coming up. And listen, you know, I remember, you know, when I got into this space and you know, heading into that 2020 draft, you know, you talk about how it's a different person every day, you know, perfect example. I remember Armando Salguero, they played Armando Salguero like a freaking fiddle. 
I remember <laughs> one day it was Herbert. The next day we were trading back for Love. The next day we were trading up for Burrow. The other day we were staying pat and trying to get Tua. Like every day it was a new quarterback with Armando Salguero. Right, I remember that. I remember that vividly. Yeah, like yep. it, it was brutal. Like I don't even read Armando's takes on the draft anymore. That's how bad it was. Like um, first I got to do this though. Shout out. Look at this, man. Shout out to all of you. Shout out to Sean Heller. He gifted five inside the NFL memberships. Robert Thomason, Marlboro Man, Juan Tulsa, Ryan Neff, and Ronaldo Petto were benefactors of that. And then shout out to Timothy Washington because Timothy Washington said, you know, I'm not going to be outdone. What do you think this is? And he came through and he donated five finside the nfl memberships as well benefiting from that is foreign butter gtb chronicles juan cruz moran fins dude michael bassett and there you go man two ten new members of the finside fam appreciate you guys for sharing the love um what is it uh where is it here hold on there's a man, dra oh, draft season makes everyone generous it looks like Oh, it's been, listen, shout out to Brad Martin. He started it. I've had literal battles in my chat of someone donates five, then someone donates 10, then someone donates 15, then someone donates 20 membership. Wow. Yeah, that's it's cool, man. Shout out to my mods, man. Because honestly, that's one of my favorite ways for people to donate because it allows other people to have usage of the emojis, get access to inside info on the uh, community board, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So right. Absolutely. It expands the community. So it's a good thing. Um, Ricky says, Neil, how was your mania experience? Uh, I mean, you know, this in a wrestling pod, um, but I would say for me, night two of WrestleMania was the coolest thing I've ever seen live. And I've been to a Super Bowl. I've been to Stanley Cup games, Orioles playoff games, some cool concerts. I've been to Marino, Jason Taylor, and Zach Thomas's Hall of Fame inductions. Um, night two of WrestleMania was absolutely bonkers. I, I think what makes the experience unique is getting to do it with my son, you know, um, at his age, just turning eight on Tuesday. So happy birthday, Chris. But, um, and he's probably listening, but. You know, to go do that at eight years old, reason you were like me when I was a kid, probably like all I ever wanted to do was go to a WrestleMania. And it's, yep. it has, it's been my bucket list forever. And, you know, life gets in the way. And, you know, I've had, uh, you know, I've had gaps in my wrestling fandom, but to get there and go there and, you know, I, my, you know, I, I, if you're not a Cody Rhodes fan, I don't know what the hell's wrong with you at this point to see him kind of get, get redemption was unbelievable. And, and my son's also a big John Cena guy. So, when that, you know, when he came out, I mean, I, I like it was it was awesome, man. It was really cool to see. And, you know, it's good to see, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think for the last few years, WrestleMania has kind of been mediocre. And I think they set the bar a lot higher. And, you know, good riddance Vince McMahon, because I think wrestling is just better at this point without him. Yeah. Last year's WrestleMania was hit or miss. There were some great matches. Um, my first WrestleMania, my only WrestleMania was six. Yep. Um, for Hogan and Warrior with my um my dad and my sister. Now I wish I had went to eighteen. I honestly like Rock Hogan stare down. Oh, oh I, like I, I missed out on that one. Like I didn't even think about going to it eighteen because I was starting to fit. That was a period where I was phasing out of re wrestling a little bit because I was too involved with you know like you know dating yeah right 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 100 you know? 100 so. same, same man well I, like it's funny because you know we could talk about this for hours but like the, when you look at the mount rushmore of wrestling at this point uh, it's hard not to keep the rock on that now man i mean oh buddy this is one of the best heel runs ever, ever. like like he made wrestlemania he elevated he truly elevated that because i'll be honest with you night one there was only really three matches I liked. I, I loved the Rhea match. I liked the Intercontinental Rhea's match. Rhea is so awesome. And she Rhea she's is like, my, she's, she's, she's one amazing. of my favorite in wrestling, period. Yeah, she's amazing. And I love that main event. I loved the tag match. I thought and the Rock getting the pin was awesome. You know, he does. Well, he, you know, to be honest with you, when I looked at the cards heading in, night two originally looked like it was going to smack night one around. And night two, I thought was unbelievable. A night two was like, I give, you know, <clears throat> night one 
was like a six and a half for me. Night two was like a nine, nine and a half for me. Like, right, right. The know, only thing I, and one and match we, I didn't like on night two. That was it. What, well, you t- like, you, like, you know what really disappointed me, bro? That Jay and Jimmy match. Like, I was expecting, yeah, for, for the bill, like. For those type of brothers who've been working together for that long, they had zero chemistry. You know, the Jade Cargill match, they didn't even give him 10 minutes, bro. I'm I like, know, they what? squashed him. Like, well, you know? and, and I'll say this, like, seeing it live, some of the moments that were really cool, like, Bailey's title win was really cool live. Like, the crowd was into it. Like, that yeah, was yeah, huge. Yeah. And, yeah, and that I, was a great match, too. One, a one great of, match too. Well, one of the biggest takeaways, period, of the whole thing for me was, I, I, I guess I didn't know Jey Uso was that over. Like the crowd loves him, and when because we went to the WWE World, which is really it was, they had an entrance stage. Yeah, it's, dude. it's their new thing, right? Instead of the, having the WrestleMania, what did they used to call it? They used to have that WrestleMania weekend, all access or whatever, right? They used to have it used to be that. Now they've changed it, right? Now it's right. WWE well, World, right? Yeah, well, it's funny because, dude, like it's so funny how just things work out because we we met the Undertaker, right? And my son even said like you know i wish you were wrestling and he's like nah just just taking it in tonight and then you know we all know what happened at the end and i agree with what you texted me that the only thing that could have made that better that whole avengers end sequence would have been and, and i love the undertaker but at the end if that should've was austin, austin i mean that I, I don't know i don't know if the the stadium could have could have held like it was unbelievable like i think that's what it was meant for i listened to kevin nash on he clicked this and he was texting austin and you know him and Austin were like the only two guys that didn't go, like in terms of like Hall of Fame bets. But yeah. I think that was meant for Austin, and I I don't know why Austin didn't do it, but it still makes sense because of Undertaker's history with like Rikishi and Yokozuna and all that kind of stuff. It still made sense, but well, it- Austin would have freaking blown the roof off Philadelphia. Never mind Lincoln Financial. Well, and, you know, The Undertaker's first match he ever wrestled, Dusty Rhodes was in the ring. And, you know, when you think about the WWE, you could say The Undertaker is the, in quote, final boss. But, uh, you know, the shirts that they were selling down there everywhere, everywhere was the Philly 316 shirts. And when you looked at, like, the merch stands, like, you know, they they put that merch together way before the event. I yeah. think they th- I think they thought they had a deal with Austin and it, it didn't come to fruition at, at the last hour. It's under- crazy because what kind of money was he asking for? <laughs> like, uh, uh, and, and like and, and I love Stone Cold. I think he's amazing. But like, you know, like as as good as a run you had in WCW, ECW, Vince McMahon made you a star. Right. Like, yeah. don't like doesn't part of you want to give back and be a part of that. But it still was awesome, man. And we could talk about WrestleMania forever. But I mean, it was so cool to see and Cody with the belt and. You know, my, my son, that's all, you know, he wants to talk about since we got back. So, uh, you know, it's, it was a blast, man. Um, shout out to Brad Martin. He donated five Finside the NFL memberships. And Chance Pope, Arthur Kinney, Eric Trujillo, and Burt Grass, and Calvin Hobbs all benefited from that. So shout out to Brad Martin. Also, shout out to Joe Cobb, he's been a member for 10 months. He said, what up, fellas? Great day to be a Dolphins fan. And Knight says it shouldn't have been Triple H. He can't because of the pacemaker, bro. Yeah, you know, he, he can't do that kind of stuff, right? So, um, all right, let's uh, – enough wrestling talk because people are like uh, – you know, people are trying to make fun of us about watching soap operas and the – you know, <laughs> That's how it is. The, hey, it is what it is. Right. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's let's get into this and let's start off – with the well it's going to be a pretty much draft centric show let's be honest with ourselves all right what so, else is going on what else is going on know, at this point really, right really right well let's start off before we get into the draft let's start off with this if you could add and i'll let you start it off if you could add one free agent out there to the miami dolphins right now before the draft who would it be I'm going to say Tyler Boyd, and I think the reason for that for me is I've already seen him excel in the number three receiver role. He complements what we have, and I, I think any pipe dreams of Brian Thomas Jr. being there at 21, aren't, it, it's not going to happen. And, you know, I like, I like a lot of receivers after Brian Thomas on my draft board, um, but, you know, would I want to take them over 21 over some of the talent that's going to be there? I think solidifying a chain mover uh, like Tyler Boyd, good hands, possession guy who has a, who, who does have a nose for the end zone. 
I, I think that would be great to know, check that need off the box heading into the draft. Cause, cause I, you know, I, I think what we see is that the three, the three positions they're attacking are going to be receiver, offensive line and edge. Right. And they have contingencies at all positions. So they've talked to Beckham. They, they're interested in Boyd. Uh, we, there's a guard who you know we, is unnamed that the Dolphins have interest in if they don't get their guy in the draft. And then they just brought in Carl Lawson uh, in this week. And and I think it tells me they're going to go to the draft and they're going to see what you know what the best player at those positions they could come out with. And I think they want to come out in the first or second round with two of those positions, then use that June first money or whatever remaining cap money they have to sign a player at the other position. And, you know, for me, Boyd, I, I think Boyd just pays immediate dividends. And, and if it's not Boyd, I, you know, it, my number two would probably be Odell, even though, um, you know, we, we that hasn't come to life, you know, after the meeting, I think there's still mutual interest, but I, I think getting a savvy veteran receiver to pair with what we have would be wise. What yeah, about so you? I, I had two just in case you took one and you took one. So mine were Tyler Boyd or Dalton Reisner. Yeah, um, and he'd be on Tyler, my short list as well. Riser would yeah. be on my short list for sure. Tyler Boyd, because like you mentioned, he can play. He, he He's already played that third fiddle, right? He's used to it. Perfect out of the slot. And I think one of the underrated aspects of his game that our coaching staff would love is his ability to block. Obviously, price tag is going to be an issue with wanting to bring in a guy like that. Because right. from what we understand, he still believes he – should er be earning around the $10 million he earned last season. So that's why he still remains out there. And then Reisner, because listen, I mean, it kind of gives you flexibility at 55. I mean, right now it feels like if they don't address it at 21, they got to turn around and address that interior at minimum, the an interior or a tackle at, you know, 55. And you got to give yourself more flexibility. I mean, Isaiah Wynn, everyone knows, you know, Again, another one we were at ahead of where as soon as we got him, left guard, left guard, where people are saying, oh, he's playing right tackle or right side. It was left guard, left guard, left guard. And sure enough, that's where he ended up playing. That's where he ended up fitting. And that's where he ended up looking dominant at times. But I always come back to his health. And what's your fallback plan right now? You know what I mean? So 100%. Dalton, right? And shout out to Daddy Dean. He says, unfortunately, my daughter and wife are at the hospital for a bad illness. Please pray for his family. So everyone give Daddy Absolutely. Dean. Uh, prayers in the chat because you know when a spouse and a child are in the hospital, man, that's that's serious times. But anyways, going back to this, like I, I, I you know, I don't think you could go wrong either way. I do agree. Listen, this is getting very interesting because I don't know if you heard. Did you hear what Drew Rosenhaus said about J.C. Latham? No, I did not. <laughs> Drew Rosenhaus is going around on television telling everyone jc latham's going in the top 10 dude i it wouldn't surprise me man i i like i i've dug into him a little bit more man and the comp that i have for him and it it, it, it it it's it's a, a player who's been retired for a while but he reminds me of flozell adams for the dallas cowboys and uh, like he he's just if he can keep his weight around 345 I think that he's one of the most plug and play ready players in this draft. I, I do. And I actually think that he can transition to the left side the I more I watch him. I agree. So like I, I like he he is high on my draft board. And I you know, we yeah. talked about this over two months ago on here that you know we heard the Dolphins were interested in like Martin. The, Liked him playing inside with the ability to kick outside. And I, I mean I, I do love him and and I guess if you think about it, could a team like the Jets take him over Olu Fashano and you watch Olu move though, man. And Olu's like, and he's only 21. He's 21, I believe, right? You're right. Man, like, come on, I'll be honest with you. I don't think you can go wrong. I really honestly, I don't think you can go wrong with Alt clear away, the number one guy. I don't yes. think you can go wrong with Alt, Foshnu, Fuaga, right? Um, uh, Fatanu or, um, or JC Latham. I really think. You can't go wrong with those top five guys. And then even then, when you start getting into Mims. the Tyler Titans and stuff and Mims, you know, I know Mims doesn't have the experience, but holy geez, when you watch the film, the, the, the ceiling on that kit, Mims has Dude. like a higher ceiling than Makai Becton did coming out. And we all did, remember how crazy people were over Makai Becton's ceiling. Did you see what Greg Cosell said about him? Um, long oh, NFL in us. 
He I said didn't. that based off of town alone, even though it's only an eight game sample size, that Marius Mims is the second best offensive tackle in this draft. Behind Buddy, all. I believe. I, what have I been saying? How long have I been saying for months? Right, for months that he just. I guarantee you, Chris Greer loves him. Well, I like it, he screams Chris Greer. And you agree? I, I think you'd agree with me here. Like, like the here's why I think this draft is so intriguing for the Dolphins. I think they have a list of their guys at 21 that they want if they're there. And I think Latu's there. I think Jared Verse is there. I think Jerzon Newton's there. I think there's probably Troy Fotnu there. Graham Barton's probably there. I don't think Powers Johnson's on that list. With that said, I think the Dolphins are going to be forced in a position where somebody is pushed into their lap. It's going to, and it's not, I don't think any of those players are the caliber of of Laramie Tunsil. But what I mean is, I could see, you remember like he fell to our, our lap and I was like, that going into that draft, I remember being like, I think Tunsil could be the number one overall pick in this yeah, entire yeah, draft. Yeah, yeah. And then when he fell in our lap, I remember because I, I um and we took Howard and I did a, a a radio segment here in Baltimore, and and I just was like, you know, I I was like, this is amazing as a Dolphins fan, like the uh, Laramie Tunsil to fall in your lap, and I just have a feeling that one of those offensive tackles is going to fall into our lap, man. Like think of this, like if Talise Fuego is on the board. Whether we would do it or not, I, I the Miami Dolphins, I feel like, would run to the podium. He yeah. could he, he could be a plug and play yep. left guard and kick out to left tackle, and man, his, some of his reps, his tapes, we all see. Or he could be uh, your starting right guard, or right, you know, like uh. I mean, like that's where this draft man is so it's so this is the hardest it's ever been for me to pinpoint who I think the Dolphins are going to draft ever. You know, it's you know, it's like listen, you know, what's crazy about this if you actually think about this. This would be the most ideal draft for finding to his blindside protector if he did not have Austin Jackson. The amount of high quality right tackles in this draft is absolutely unreal. Like unreal. Like well, like seven or eight of my top ten guys like have experience either are starters or have experience at right tackle. Like right. it's crazy. Well, and look, I, I think the Dolphins next year worst case scenario are going to be drafted in the 23 to 32 range. Right. And like, I like if they want one of those defensive players really bad yet, one of those offensive linemen fall, fall in their lap. This to me is the season in terms of draft capital to go in. And, and what I mean by that is if you get one of your defensive stalwarts that you want at 21 and it's picked 25 and the green Bay Packers are on the board and Amarius Mims is still there. If you're the Miami Dolphins, trade next year's first round pick and this year's fifth round pick to get in there and get them. Like, you know what I mean? Like, do something mm-hmm. bold because the talent, I mean, offensive tackle next year is actually really strong, but most of the other positions are way weaker than this year. So, like, like, I, like, it don't, don't hold yourself hostage, man. If there's two guys you love and they're on the board, Find a way or, or trade this year's second and a second year next year to get back up there in the end of round one. And, you know, if you say, say you go Jared Verse or Latu at 21 and Graham Barton's on the board at, you know, 27 when Arizona has their second pick of the draft and you can move up and get you like, I, I just think there's there's so much talent that is top talent here. And I, and I think it's universal. Like, I don't think it's just twitter draft guys like myself that feel that way i think nfl scouts nfl front offices feel that way you know be bold man because you're the dolphins are going to be forced into a pickle where i i don't see any surprises in the negative but i do see them being surprised that player x is on the board when they pick that and they, they probably go into the draft thinking there's no way possible this guy's going to be available and that's that's an awesome position to be in because all we know is this at this point. Only 20 players can go before us, right, before we're on the clock. And, man, there's there's more than 20 players that I'd be okay with that the Dolphins got, and that's a good problem to have. See, listen, I, I can't get on board with this Graham Barton first-round talk. I'm sorry. I just can't. Like, this guy went from a second-slash-third-rounder so all of a sudden people just started falling in love with him over the last month, month and a half. And he's just jumped. I, I, I just, I, I, I don't have a first round grade on Graham Barton. Um, you know, I like this, you know, I, I will tell you right now, anyone saying he was the number one center over Zach Frazier. I, how Zach Frazier has, has legitimate number one snaps in this, like number one center one snaps. How many does Barton have on tape? Like that's, 
to project him over a guy like Zach Frazier or even the guys like Cedric Van Pran or Jackson Powers Johnson, I, I just can't get – like that is – purely a projection for those people that are saying he's their center one or I just I, I don't listen I don't even have him as my top rated I have him listed as a guard Me slash too. center I'm on both I'm, of my I don't even have him listed as a top you know as the top guard in this class yeah I, I see I, I have fought fought new as the top guard I, I I think fought new's best position is guard it's really hard when players have that type of versatility I have Fatanu as number five tackle or number one guard. That's how yeah. I have him. Yeah, I, and, and I think there's a huge gap between Fautno and, and Barton. What I what I think they like scouts like about him is his versatility. versatility his, I guess his, his, his he, he plays nasty. I think people like that about him. He's got great athleticism given his size. Like you know, but the one thing I'll say that against him is the a- ACC in college football is kind of a joke at this point, right? Like it, it's definitely not the SEC. Um, you know, I, I do like Graham Barton, but at 21 to me, it's a mega reach. Uh, like he's not a guy that I think goes, uh, dude, I'll tell you this. I don't think he's on the board when we drafted 21, which sounds crazy. That's crazy. I know. I, I, but I, I've heard there's a couple teams that really, really like him, and they even like him at offensive tackle, which to me is just, I, I mean, that's a projection and a half for me, but he's, he's the guy right now, man. It's got a lot of popular buzz. I think his, his, uh, Pro day did him a lot of favors, um, and a lot of those run grading running teams, run, uh, road grading running teams are looking at him. Um, but yeah, he's a he's a player on the rise. I you know, and we could we, 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 I got him as guard three, and I got him as center four. Yeah, yeah, I have him as guard two, but like I have other people very close to him. It, it, it's it's tight, it's tight, and if and, and if to that case reason exactly why if it's tight. Don't force the pick. That feels like a forced pick to me personally. Yeah, uh, I, it feels, I agree with that. It kind of feels forced. I, and honestly, I'll be honest. I think Jackson Powers Johnson feels a little forced. And I like I both. I like both players. I just like for me. But they're it, not taking interior twenty one. That's just I, that's not his mo. It's going to be if it's offensive line, it's going to be tackle. Well, and, and here's you. You named Dalton Risner, right? Yeah. In year one. In year one, because I think all the players we're talking about have the potential to be better than Dalton Risner. But in year one, will they be? And that that's a I don't know. I don't know. And I I don't know who said it this week, but it was kind of it was posted out there and everyone Dolphins Twitter was talking about it. But it was kind of like that guards don't matter was the overall approach. And, and, I, and I forget who said it. And, and oh, I that was who, Barry Jackson. He said they're like acorns or whatever. Right. Right. right? Yeah. That's, that's yeah, exactly yeah. what I think. And, and I don't necessarily agree with that in totality, but I do agree with it with the talent in this year's draft that if you're drafting interior offensive line, you're focused on filling a need over the best player available. You can start um, at 55. You can and you can start at 55 and still get a good enough guy. And, and there's only one exception to that rule to me, and that's Troy Fontenot. He's the exception yeah. to that rule yeah, for me because of the versatility to kick outside. Bro, I tackle. Think, well, that's the thing. This whole Graham Barton, though you just mentioned the teams believing. I think Troy Fontenot is better at I think he's got a better shot of succeeding at tackle in the NFL than Graham Barton does. Oh, he, de- he, de- he definitely I, – look, I will say this. As much as Which I – makes love, him higher value, right? That makes him more higher value. Yeah, I love Joe Walt. I have Joe Walt as my fourth overall player in this draft. I have Fontenu, I think, as my seventh or eighth. But I think Fontenu has every chance to be the best offensive lineman in this entire draft. God, I By, love Joe Walt. I do love Joe Walt. And, and I, you know what? It's going to be – film? Cr- oh, my God. Where, where he goes, I think, is ox- so actually one of going to be one of the sh- – the, 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 the kind of crossroads of the draft because I, I just have a feeling, man, and I know that they need receivers and they lost all their weapons. I just have a feeling the Chargers are going to go Joe Walt. I really do, even though he's never played right tackle. I, I just have a feeling they'll figure it out. I, look at Jim Harbaugh, the way he builds. He, he likes physical smash mouth football. You tell me that Joe Walt and Rashawn Slater are your offensive tackles for the next eight years. Or maybe that's where the J.C. Latham top 10 pick from Rosenhaus is coming from. And, and honestly, man, that wouldn't surprise me either. Um, someone but, asked me on, on Twitter this morning. They said, reason if you could trade up into the, into you know, he's if you could trade up into the teen range, who would you bang the table for? And I told them either Brock Bowers 
or whichever OT between Joe Alt, Olufashnu, Talise Fuago, or JC Latham in that order is still on the board and in range. Those are the only players I would move up for. If you could land me one of those top four guys, or you could land me um, Brock Bowers, those are the only guys I'd move up for in the draft. Oh, dude, Bowers would be my number one choice. I, I, I like, I, 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 this is a kind of a bold statement. I think Brock Bowers' best landing spot is the Miami Dolphins for him. I think personally. it's us or Cincinnati. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly. I agree with you, and I, and I think that you know, um, I've heard some noise that the Colts are interested in them. Um, so, so, yeah, yeah. So like that Falcons and pick at eight and that's Chicago bears pick at nine, I think are trade targets. But if he survives that top 10, cause I, I, I look, I don't want this to happen, but the I, medicals because of the medicals I, or just the positional value, um, yeah. which, which look, dude, we all know this teams overthink the draft every year. I, I have a hard time seeing him last past the jets though. And I hope he does not go to the jets. But man, like, could you imagine Brock Bowers and Jono Smith as our one and two with Durham as our three tight end? And 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 it solves the problem that we have because, sure, they're looking at a veteran wide receiver. But what we truly need is a third passing target. Like Brock Bowers can line up in the slot and be everything Mike Gesicki wasn't. Right? Like that's what Brock yeah. Bowers can be. And, and I would and say, the, can we just kill the notion that he's? you know, a terrible blocker. He's a decent blocker, but the key with Brock Bowers is he's willing. He's willing. And as he gets to the next level and his play strength increases, he's going to become a better blocker. That's the difference between Brock Bowers and Mike Gusecki. Brock Bowers is willing to take on the physical aspect of the game. Gusecki is not, but sorry, continue. I had to get that out of the way because no. I hear people saying he can't block, but that's just totally not true. I I'm going to put this in perspective of how good I think Brock Bowers is. We both loved Sam Laporta last year. If we had a first round pick that didn't get stolen from us because of the the boat scandal thing, oh, I wish we both wish we would have taken Sam Laporta in the first round. That fair state fair statement. Oh, buddy, please. Yes. So I have the gap between Brock Bowers and Sam Laporta bigger than the gap that I have between Caleb Williams and JJ McCarthy in this year's draft. That's how high I think of Brock Bowers. Like I yeah. think Brock Bowers is a Hall of Fame caliber football player. Like. Yeah it's hard to predict that level of success. But I, I would say if you ask me who would make the Hall of Fame between these two players, Marvin Harrison Jr. or Brock Bowers, I'd put Bowers over Harrison Jr. And that's not not because I think he's a better prospect. It's because I think at that position, the NFL has been starved for a difference maker for years. And you yeah. come in there and Travis Kelsey's probably not playing forever, right? And Mark Mark Andrews is already really dinged up in this point of his career. Sam Laporta's up there. George Kittle's good, man, but I, I think he's a little overrated at this point. Like, I just have a feeling that when we start next year's football season, Brock Bowers is the best tight end in the game. And yeah, it's, it seems like in 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 three years, it, this could be Brock Bowers, Sam Laporta, and Kyle Pitts's league. You know what I mean? Like that's where it seems it could end. Tavian Sanders has has a shot, and this guy's in this. You know, Theo Johnson has a high upside. Jared Wiley has a high upside. Ben Sinot has a high upside. There's guys in this draft, but I agree with you, Brock Bowers. It seems like give him two or three years, and he will be the best. It'll be him or Laporta as the best in the league. Yeah, and we don't want the Jets, the Bengals, or a team that well, were let me ask you that. Do you competition think Jets, to get them. Do you think the Jets they could target? You don't think they would target a guy like? I don't know, like Fuaga or if Latham's still on the board. Because more would Morgan Moses really stop you from taking no. one of those top flight? You know, one of my quotes I would say, you never let good players stop you from drafting great players. Right. Would, would, would Morgan Moses stop you from drafting one of those guys and then you could pair them with Tyron Smith? I know it wouldn't stop me. No, he's a journeyman right tackle who played really good in Baltimore. Everyone plays good in Baltimore. They're the best coach team in football. And Lamar Jackson in that running game makes everybody look pretty damn good when it comes to run blocking, right? So yeah. at the end of the day, I, I think Morgan Moses is a good player. Uh, he's he'd be a good swing tackle. But like, if I'm the Jets, if I'm making that move, it's Olu Fashano, it's Talise Fuego or J.C. Latham for me. Yeah. And that's Ty, look, their season's over. If Aaron Rodgers goes down, Tyrone Tyron Smith hasn't played a full season in eight years. He's missed an average of, over that time period. He's missed an average of six games each year like your season there Teron Armstead right right like 
and 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 that's why like I don't want him to pick Brock Bowers because I don't give a shit about the uh, Aaron Rodgers era, but yeah, I don't yeah. want him to be in our decade for that team for against us for the next decade. Yeah. But to be honest, when you look at the Aaron Rodgers era, like it, it could go. He's 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 going to be forty when the season starts, coming off an Achilles. The only player that's ever succeeded in that scenario ever is Tom Brady. Ever. That's it. That's the list. It's true. It's true. And so, you know, I bring up Marino's injury all the time and he had it 10 years prior to Rogers, same injury. And he was never the same. We all know the cliff Brett Favre fell off of around the same age as Aaron Rodgers when he had that, when he had that. I mean, let me ask you this before we get into more stuff here. If you're dead set on a weapon now, listen, here's my, everyone knows I, BPA in the first, especially at 21, reaching is what'll get you fired. Right. But if you want a weapon and you're only reaching like five to 10 picks, you're not reaching like 20 picks. Right. And you want to keep them out of Buffalo. Would you take Xavier Leggett at 21 if all, let's say those top, let's say the top five tackles, including Fatanu, are gone. Let's say the top four receivers are gone. Let's say Brock Bowers is gone. Let's say Turner and Latu and Newton are off the board. Would you take Xavier Leggett at 21? Well, he's my wide receiver five. So when, when I think about it, I have Harrison one, neighbors two. I actually have Brian Thomas Jr. three and Roma Dunes a four. That's the um, only difference. I have them flipped. Yep, and and then my fifth is Leggett. So, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I think he could be. You know, I put this in quote our version of Devo Samuel. If that scenario played out, what I would try to do is because the Bills are at twenty eight, we're at twenty one. I would try to find a trade partner that we could just move a spot or two down, even just to get a fourth round pick, right? A yeah. And then make that move. Twenty one would be a little rich, but I wouldn't be upset. The player that would get me upset at twenty one is the other Xavier. That I'm worried about. I'll be honest. What I'm worried about in this draft is Mike McDaniel being a kid in a candy store and seeing that speed in Texas. I'm worried about that. And it's not that I don't think Xavier Worthy is a good player. I like him. I He's just don't. Sixth receiver, isn't he? Yeah. I just want, like, I want something different because I need somebody when it's third and seven that can go over the middle take a big hit and make a catch that moves the chains. I want somebody that can catch a two-yard pass that's not just winning off of speed, but that can create with physicality, who can block yeah. downfield. I love Leggett. So you, you, yeah, and, and I've seen mocks where he's in like, the, he's available in the middle of the second round. And I'm just like, how? Like, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think he gets past the twenties. I don't think he gets past the bills. I think uh, AD Mitchell and Leggett, do not get past the Bills and the Chiefs. Yeah, the only thing that could happen, I think, that could push them is if this, like Ricky Purcell, I like him. Don't get me wrong. But man, that guy's stock is skyrocketing right now, man. If he and Lad McConkey just got really hot, like maybe it could push him down. But yeah, yeah. I mean, dude, I, to answer your question, I love Xavier Leggett and I would love to him to be the number three option here. He's, he, he's a difference maker and he's, exactly the compliment that we would need to what our receiving core is at this point. So, you know, don't look, if they have a conviction for them, go get your guy. Like don't, don't, don't. Cause if, cause Buffalo is a team I worry about with uh, Xavier Leggett. And I, he's another guy that I don't want to see against us twice a year. Yeah. Um, in terms of worthy, like the issue for me is obviously his size. Um, you know, he's got, really poor hands at times um can't make contested catches and then with Purcell you know listen it, he's got play strength issues as well and he's got issues with press because of it and my thing with Purcell and why I don't know if he'd be hugely you know adored is he's not exactly super elusive or a yak guy right like that's not part of his game so yeah, I, I don't I don't know, man. I struggle. Like I'll tell you right now, Xavier Worthy is my wide receiver twelve and Ricky Purcell is my wide receiver fourteen. Yeah, now I'm I, higher on Jalen Polk than a lot of people. Um, but you know, like and uh you know, but like I would take Keon Coleman over those guys, right? You know, I'd take eighty. I like I like Keon Coleman a lot. Yeah, you know, I you know I'm high on this guy than a lot of other people, but Roman Wilson's a guy I would take Roman Wilson at 5'10, 185, running a four three nine. You know, I would, I would, I would take him 
over the I'd take Malachi Corley over them. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah, no, it's it's tough, man. I, yeah, I I I just have a, I have, I I'm nervous. Like I am a little nervous that we like I just think he could be on the radar worthy. And, and I do and look I the speed. I, yeah, yeah, because of speed and like I I think it's the one thing that we got to stop doing is just because someone's small and fast comparing them to Tyree Kill. That's a, oh. that's a, that's laughable. Buddy, Tyree dude, Kill's a one. Bucks- this guy's a buck sixty-five and and does not like the physical aspect of the game. He is not Tyree Kill in, in NFL history, in the history of this league. Tyree Kill's a one of one in the history of this game. Like there's the, the, the likelihood in my lifetime that there's going to be another player that's built with the same characters of T- Tyree Kill are slim. Like he's just it's 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 laughable whenever someone's a quick wide receiver. We, they've done it in the draft for years, man. Everybody who's small and fast is compared. Like Tyreek Hill is just different. Like it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's just a laughable thing for me, man. Like I, I've seen a couple people put that out there and I'm just like, dude, like don't buy into every player's hype like that. Like that, that's, it's just not fair to players that are elite at that level to say anyone who's like that is that, but you know, it's, We'll see, because I like you and I both agree that it wouldn't shock us if a receiver went at twenty-one, uh, especially if someone fell that shouldn't. But I am a little worried that it, it might be worthy, and it's not that I don't like worthy again. I think it's too much of the same. Well, he'd be like, here's the thing: like I'm trying to remember, there was a receiver in the last two or three years that like, draft Twitter was high on, and then his weight came in, and he was like one fifty or one sixty something. I'm trying to remember. Do you remember who it was? I'm thinking. I I know what you're talking about. He was it's a not, speed guy. It wasn't Rondell Moore. It was someone else. Yeah, I remember. Well, remember who. But, look, but look, that's look. the thing. Like, he'd have to be an outlier at 165. Like, you are an outlier in the NFL at 165. Well, look at the decline after his rookie year of Hollywood Brown, for example. Right? Like, look at what happened there. Like, he went to Baltimore. He had a 1,000-yard season as a rookie. You know, we already knew that in that one big – the home opener against us, he had those two huge touchdowns on us. Whatever happened. But then he went to Arizona. He was pedestrian. He he. he oh, I think he's two two. Was it two two? It was two two Atwell. Oh, two two right? Atwell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's who exactly who it was from coming out of yeah. Louisville. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Super outlier, right? Like he's he, 165 nine, 165. And he's been hurt a lot because <laughs> he's small. Yeah. And he's, been, and he's really been delegated to a, a number four wide receiver with return responsibilities. So no, yeah, it's it, dude, it's. There's so much like I, like I think this is one of the hardest mock drafts to do too because it, it, it seems like it makes my, most sense in the top ten to go to a certain order. But we, you and I both know it's the old Mike Tyson theory. Everyone's got a plan so you get punched in the face. Like there was going to be two or three curveballs in the top ten that just throw off this entire draft. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And we still haven't even really talked about what if a team knks on the door for. Penix or Bo Nix. It's you know I, mean? I, I think it's very likely that Michael Penix goes in the top fifteen. Yeah, uh, we're gonna have five quarterbacks in the top fifteen. That's crazy. And and, and I think Bo Nix still finds a way to go at the end of the first round. I, I like think of the Giants don't get their guy right. Like, say someone moves ahead of them and they don't get McCarthy. Like, I could see the Giants trying to package a picks to move back up to the end of the first round to get Bo Nix. Mm. And that's crazy to me. Like. I don't have a first round grade on Bo Nix at all. At all. Like no, 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 no. Neither do I. And I like Penix. And and I think you Penix had, has a second round grade on for me. Yeah, well, top fifteen with he, that's 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 how GMs get fired. I'm that's how you get fired. Taking a player with I'll a be, second round grade with a top fifteen pick. If I stick to my original grades, JJ McCarthy don't even have a first round grade for me. Yeah, he's outside of mine. Uh, but yeah. but I, I I'll tell you what I gotta give second. him. A he has credit. a second. He has a second round grade for me. He, yeah, he's he has grown on me a little bit though because I'll say this: he has tremendous poise, and his demeanor. You know, he rem- his demeanor reminds me of actually Joe Flacco in Baltimore, where he was kind of unfathomable a little bit. Like you know, you couldn't you couldn't really shake him up. He you know he can play well in the big games. He does things within his limits. He doesn't try to be something he's not. And he he's he's nimble in the pocket. You know what I mean? Like I I don't mm-hmm. hate JJ McCarthy. Now top ten pick for me again. That's how you get fired as a GM because you're taking a guy who's got good qualities, but you're taking him with a luck a, a premium draft pick. And if it doesn't pan out, you're done. Yeah, 
Yeah, agreed. Like, like how Joe Douglas is going to have a job still after the Zach Wilson shenanigans to me. I don't care about them getting Aaron Rodgers. That's bad. That's I think bad this is operations. It, I think this is it, though. I think we're witnessing we're about to witness the last year of Douglas and Salah. To be honest, Salah is awful, man. I'll, he's he's might be the worst head coach in all. Of football. I'll take him as our defensive coordinator. I ain't gonna lie. Yeah. If we if Weaver gets a new job, you know. Yeah. I um, do that. All right. Let's get into this. Speaking of interesting here from ESPN, I believe this is behind a paywall. Shout out to Canada for not being behind the paywalls. Only the U U.S. guys get hit with it, but. They're talking about um, – they have an article here about the latest draft buzz and rumors, right, about all 32 teams. Now, in this section here, what we're hearing about the Dolphins draft, and this is from Matt Miller, the Dolphins round one targets are tough to nail down, but scouts for opposing teams believe the offensive line will be the team's priority at number 21. Miami did just lose some key players of that unit in free agency. But what about day two? I've heard tight end is a position to watch. I think TCU's Jared Wiley, Kansas State's Ben Sinnott, and Texas Jatavian, Texas's Jatavian Sanders are names to watch at 55. So, you know, you've been on social media. You've seen people up in arms. Oh, if we take a receiver in the first round or an edge round, I'm going to lose my mind. We need to take offensive line. Breathe easy, people. Breathe easy because rival scouts believe we are going offensive line. Now, I'll, this is where I'll push back on that report. There is no way in hell I see them going back-to-back -back offensive picks. I mean, I'm here for it. Don't get me wrong. I'm down for it, but I don't see it happening. I, I really yeah. don't until you, unless they add a third or fourth. Well, here's what we know. If they go through this draft and they take the best players available and they don't fill what we deem is their needs, they have $18.5 coming from it. You can afford Carl Lawson, Dalton Risner, and Odell Beckham with that money. Right, like you could easily afford all three of those players, so you could fill all those little needs. If that, and I'm just using those players as representation. Yeah. So you can go and do whatever the hell you want in this draft. And for me, if you tell me they leave with a Troy Fountainew in round one and a Jatavian Sounder is in round two, that's an A plus draft for me. So I, I like I, I I don't hate it. Like I like I've learned after following the NFL draft, and, and this is my 19th year of, of covering it that I've actually made boards and did all that stuff. What I've realized is that like the teams that draft off of need are the ones that always have needs. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they're yeah. the ones that always have needs and the teams that draft the best players, you don't know enough about their needs because they still find a way to win. And like, like I think it's just amazing, right? Like you, you see teams that do this quite often. And, and I, I always go to my local well with the Baltimore Ravens, but like when they find these diamonds in a rough, like Matt Judon, Brandon Williams, Justin Matabuki, they didn't need defensive tackles when they needed, they drafted Matabuki. They didn't need one, but he was a good player on their board. So they took him and they yeah. developed him. Right. So like where the dolphins are as a franchise for me is I'm okay with their roster the way it is going into week one right now, if everyone stayed healthy, not to say it's perfect. And I'd love to see them do some stuff in June, but I'm okay with it. Like sure. They lost Christian Wilkins. I like what they did. T.R. Tart, man was a great pickup, man. I really like that. Neville Gallimore. Like these guys are going to be rotated. They're going to be fresh. You know, we don't have injury diagnosis or updates on Phillips or Chubb, but like, Jack Barrett was a great contingency plan for that, right? Our linebacker core is going to be night and day better than what it was last year. Our whole secondary is going to be night and day better. I think that they've gotten by Jack Driscoll as a solid, savvy pickup. Isaiah Wynn coming back. Kendall Lamb coming back. Like, they made the nice – Jono Smith is better than any tight end we've had in a long time. He's a better player than Mike Kosicki. Like, you know, it just is what it is. Waddle yeah. is going to be healthy. Our team's going to be healthier. Like, the Dolphins are, are – in. Year three of an offensive system when implemented is its peak. It's where it's going to hit its pinnacle. Tua, Mike McDaniel, this offense is going to be at its peak this year. Like, I'm okay them doing whatever the hell they want at 21 as long as they don't pull a stretch Armstrong and reach. reach. Like, if you – like like any of those offensive linemen that we just talked about at Nauseam, any of those defensive players we talk about at Nauseam, I, I put out a thing where I created a 15-man – Miami Dolphins big board based off of what I think they're, you know, how I would look at it. Like mm -hmm. very few players on that list. would be My 15th guy was Darius Robinson at Missouri. 
And I would say that 21, love- that's, yeah, I like them at 21. That's a little much of a reach. I'd like to trade back, but like worst case scenario, like, like this won't be a Charles Harris moment for me. Yeah, right. Yeah, like, yeah. Like yeah, this, yeah. like you know, like I'll be honest, and, and, and like there's a lot of players that I like. My number one defensive guy is Jerzon Newton. I've loved him for a long time. I, you know, yeah. I've talked about it forever. Bro, you're the reason why I didn't put him on my man crush list. He had some of the funnest tape, but I Ever. didn't want to steal your thunder. Right? Yeah. I mean, look, I'm not saying he's Aaron Donald as a pro. I'm saying he's every bit the prospect Aaron Donald was at Pitt. I'll tell you this much. There ain't a better, listen, because I know there was discussion on X about, well, you know, they've added these rotational pieces and Weaver likes, we already have Sealer and and you can add rotate and Weaver likes to rotate next to their main guy. Here's my thing. You think I'm going to let anyone in that rotation you name from Benito Jones, whether they're filling in for Raekwon Davis all the way out to fill in for Christian Wilkins. You think I'm going to let Jonathan Harrison, Deshaun Hand, this rotation stop me from drafting Newton if he's on the tip? When you Listen, I'm going to tell you this right now. You know why Newton might be one of the smartest picks for this team in the draft? That's going to ease, ease, ease the loss for Dolphin fans real quickly of Christian Wilkins when they see him on the field. There is not one better. better there He's is a better prospect. Not, there is not a better one for one replacement for Wilkins in this draft than Newton. And I'll go even further. Like I've said before, Newton offers you far higher upside as a pass rusher than Wilkins did. Yeah, he's way more disruptive on every snack. And you know what Nasty. else? He's a mean son of a bitch. And that's what I was going to say. Like my two favorite players, my two favorite for the Dolphins are Newton and Troy Fontenot. Not just because they're great players at their position, they are tone changers to your franchise. Everyone wants to talk about the Dolphins being soft, whatever, which I think is overstated. Well, you had guys like Troy Fontenot and Jerzon Newton that are going to kick your teeth down your skull. You know, like those are the type of players that change that demeanor. And that's why, like, those two guys are like, I have circle start. Like, they are the best case scenarios for me. I I do think that Jerzon Newton is going to be there on the board when the Dolphins are at 21. I don't don't know, man. What do you worry about, the Saints? Uh, he's so good, man. I, I just like anyone who watches his tape and watches Byron Murphy's tape and thinks Murphy's should no. be drafted ahead of them. I think you're crazy. It's and crazy. I, I think NFL scouts are going to say, let me ask you this. If he's on the board in the fifth round, is he still, is he completely off your board or because of the whole Miami nightlife or would you ent- entertain Trevon Day sweat if he's still on the board? I, I mean, look for me, man, I would entertain him for sure. And I know he's had his troubles, you know, and I saw this whole article about how, you know, their, their teams are worried about his party. And then he got this after all that. But like in the fifth round, what you're either trying to do is accumulate depth or find a gem. Trying to get talent. Yeah. And that's right. A gem potentially. And, and, and I, Tavondre sweat on the field. Take all that red tape yeah. off. It, 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 it's a home run. And, and we, we mentioned this, right? Those are the type of guys, again, and I'm using this as an example again, that the Baltimore Ravens will take a chance on, and then four years later when they leave in free agency and they get a third-round compensatory pick for and a guy, guy who drafts. Right. <laughs> yeah, because he's, you know, they draft, they draft a guy in the fifth round, they get two full rounds better of a draft pick, and they get four years of top, you know, top-tier play from a player. Tavondre Sweat would not be off my board. In fact, I think the best GMs in football if you trust your organization, you better find those guys. I highlight those guys. And yeah. I say, look, if, if if it's the end of fourth round and I have to parlay one of my sixth and a fifth to move up to get this guy. All day. All but like, day. you know, like, 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 I took Fountainew at, at 21. I took I took Jatavian Sanders at 55. I need to make a stamp on the defensive side of the ball. Let me go get this guy that on two downs, I guarantee – is going to be, I mean, you know, uh, this is a more high praise. He, when I watch Tavondre sweat, I see a little Vince Wilfork and like that, that, that's pretty high praise. And, you know, I'm not saying he's going to be Vince Wilfork, but I'm saying yeah. like there's moments in his game where he flashes mm-hmm. and this, this adversity, this DWI is either going to sink him completely or he's going to learn his lesson. If he learns his lesson and you get him in round five, one of the biggest deals of this draft. Well, it's not obviously not the same situation because it's injury compared to a DWI. But one of the moves we praised was the Voorhees selection. How it's 
you are looking towards the future. You are not looking towards right now. And when Voorhees is healthy, he's going to be a stud. It's just like when Travandre Sweat gets his mind right and gets his stuff behind him, he's going to be a, a lane clogger and he's going to be a stud on the inside. Dude, you're 100, 150% right. I was pounding the table in round six, seven last year for the Dolphins. Yeah, to take so Andrew Voorhees. Unbelievable. And, and, and early word here in Baltimore is that he looks sensational. I believe it. He's, he's strong he's as hell in the gym. And him next to Tyler Linderbaum is just nasty, right? Like, it's nasty. Look at who and they that, let walk. Look at who they let walk because of their faith in him. Right. Right, man. And, and they let Zeitler and Simpson go. Yeah. And, and like, it's like, I, I see, that's where it's like, I like, and this isn't to me to be gushing about the Baltimore Ravens. I just view them as the best run franchise in the league. And I want to operate like them. Well, I want to operate. Right. Ozzy was there. Right. Like, I love how they operate in the later rounds. Like, that you, we laugh about this and we've talked about this reason, but like the year we took Blake Ferguson, we both wanted James Prochet, but yeah. Baltimore took him a whole round later and still got him. Yeah. And Pro, you know, Prochet might not have lived up to the hype that I thought he was going to be, but like, still, you know, he was a viable receiver there who was a return man there and made big plays. And I, yeah. you know, there's no perfect sign to the signs to this, but man, taking good football players that are risky. That's all life's about is, is yeah. mitigating your risk, but you got to take a risk. You know what I mean? Like you got to have the guts, the marbles to have convictions. And if you run a good, well oiled, um, a well, good oiled machine as an organization, those type of players can get acclimated pretty quick. Now Miami's challenging, right? Like it's a different nightlife. Like it's, you know, I'll tell you, man, there's a lot of parts of Baltimore that where I live, it's very boring. It's not, you know, there's, yeah. it's definitely not South beats. Right. So the, you know, the, you know, by the castle here at Owens mills, sure. You might go, you know, yeah. might, you could go try boring some really hot. Unless you're, boring is better unless you're Willis McGahee in Buffalo. Right. Right. Jason right. Myers says we took Ryan Hayes. And st- oh my God. Don't even remind us. Um, Let's get into this. Finally here. Um, interesting little tidbit out of one of Barry Jackson's articles, the final thing to talk about here. Um, He said the Dolphins are showing interest in other second round safeties. We hear they're intrigued by Cole Bishop of Utah. And that's interesting to me because Cole Bishop is a stud in this draft. Love him. Yeah, he's actually my third overall safety, Cole Bishop. Um, And then the other little tidbit here is we hear Coach Mike McDaniel, who attended Yale, is intrigued by Yale receiver Mason Tipton, who ran a four three one in the forty. He had fifty. Now I haven't watched Tipton yet. Um, he had fifty three catches for nine hundred and seven yards and ten touchdowns. Um, he, they look at the Dolphins are taking a hard look at Tipton. So from everything I understand from people I trust, he's a seventh rounder slash UDFA type of selection um in terms of tipton now let's start off with cole bishop i'll let you go because you obviously had something you wanted to say but with tipton you know to me it just looks like you know he's a little undersized he's what five nine like 179 Right. So um, I got to dive into the film. I'll dive into the film tonight. But obviously, he's got some speed to him. Um, But Cole Bishop, what are your thoughts? I want to get your thoughts on Cole Bishop because, you know, safety is my next big board. And it's a position where, you know, clearly look at that. That's one position that no one's talking a lot about, Neil, yet. Look at they have not been adamant they're more adamant in trying to add carl lawson another rotational veteran edge rusher than helping than adding behind poyer and holland where it's only elijah campbell right now which screams to me watch safety watch safety watch out yeah i I feel like getting jordan poyer for two million dollars is like getting buffalo wings 20 years ago right remember you know you know good value right like buffalo wings used to be 9.99 all you could eat right and, and now they're expensive as hell here. But like Jordan Poyer, great football player. But like, look, I, look, I, I there, he'll probably miss a game or two, right? Like, he's an aging player. He's a great veteran. But you know, I, I think for, there's two things: we need depth at the position, and Weaver's going to util, utilize three safety sets, right? Like, we can agree on that. Yeah. And I think that like safety low key is a position in round two that I think the Dolphins could quietly be all over, right? And it makes a lot of sense. Cole Bishop would be a really nice yin to Javon mm. Holland's yang. Uh, he would really pair nicely uh, there. 
Um, I, man, he honestly, Cole Bishop would be a really nice fit in this Dolphins defense. And and on the yeah receiver, I'm not gonna lie, man. I didn't even know who he was until I saw that, and yeah, I yeah, looked him did. up. I looked him up too. Yeah, yeah. I, I looked him up. I, I'll be 100 percent honest. I I know a lot yeah, of prospects. I, <laughs> I didn't know him, but I tell you what, man, you talk about being selected in the seventh round and being an immediate teacher's pet. Like I can see why that happening here in Miami for sure. Yeah. So it, it's interesting, man. And and I'll ask friend of the podcast uh, Jennifer Forbush um, because I know she knows a lot about Holy Cross, Yale football. She was in a space yeah. talking a lot about it. So I'll, I'll ask her if, she, if that name rings a bell and what she thinks. What's funny is we, me and her were talking about Holy Cross just a couple of nights ago and stuff because obviously there's a few players, you know, in this draft that intrigue me, right? Um, she loves Jalen Coker, right? Yeah, she, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, the guy who I'm um, higher on than most people is, um, you know, the guard Hanson out of oh. Holy Cross, right? Oh, he's um, he's a great player. Yeah, I, li- I like him a, a yeah, 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 I like a him a lot. Yeah, yeah, I like him a lot. Um, so now with me and Cole Bishop, I think, you know, you saw him, he's used as a nickel linebacker at times at Utah. I mean, you know, he can lay the smack down like the rock we talked about earlier. Um, you know, he can make plays on the football. I think Cole Bishop would be, I agree with you. He'd be an absolutely amazing complimentary piece. And, you know, you nailed on the head Weaver and, you know, Mike McDonald last year, they loved those three safety rotations, and I, I just think they're going to add. I, I really think this is the sneaky pick at 21 or 55. This is the one that people got to really be looking over the shoulder at is the safety class because not like you're not hearing a lot of round one safety chatter. You're really not if you think no. about it, right? Like other than Cooper Dijon, who you know who could play really – corner or safety you know i put him in my man crutch list at corner and safety because he fits both you can play him anywhere other than him i who would you really take in the first round at safety i mean you know i think i don't think tyler nubian's going in i don't think Jalen hicks or javon bullard or kalen bullock is like i'm super high on one of my man crushes of the safety classes dadrian taylor demerson out of texas tech texas tech yeah He's not going in the first, right? Like, I think Cooper DeJean is the only one that I think may be going the first. I mean... And teams think he's a corner, too. Like, I have him yeah. as a safety, but a lot of teams think well, he... Well, I have him on both. I have him right. safety and my corner uh, big board. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. He's a yeah. stud. Bro. Yeah, oh, I, I love Cooper DeJean. I, 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 you know, I, I was... I, I, he's one of the guys that fell a little bit when I say he fell like six, seven spots on my final big board. And, and yeah. that was just more of the evolution of some other players. Like I moved Lath- yeah. Latham above him. Originally, I didn't have that. Um, yeah. I put Latu over him and I originally didn't have that. Um, you know, I, there, I forget there's a couple other guys and, and I still love like Cooper DeJean. If he's our pick at, at 21, a lot of people probably scratch oh. their head. I'd be ecstatic for that, by the oh. way. Ecstatic. I, I actually think he's going to go one spot ahead of us to Pittsburgh. Uh, I think mm. he's a perfect fit. Pair him with Minka Fitzpatrick. Let him be versatile. Um, you know, Steelers love their defensive backs that have versatility. Rod Woodson, right? Like, it, it could just make a lot of sense. So, we'll see, man. But, like, yeah, man, I, I think safety is a position that the Dolphins should definitely be focused on. And if they don't get one in the draft, man, I'll tell you what a pipe dream of mine is. Justin Simmons. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I think that's it's my... too much money because they got to pay Javon, right? Yeah. Well, here do you – do you and we don't want to go on this tangent yet, but do you think there's that Javon Holland's part of the long term plans, or do you think there? I think he is, but I think uh, from what I've heard, and I had this on a Patreon in a channel member update a couple weeks ago. From what I've heard, um, he wants to reset the market. Um, athletes first, as we all know. When you actually sit back and think about this, think about this one. When you listen to ESPN or these media outlets, Athletes First has done a damn good job of keeping his name in the rotation of top young safeties in the NFL, and there's a reason to that. I think this is potentially, if they do not get something hammered out, because he was apparently on an IG Live a couple months ago, and he said the Dolphins are going to have to back the Brink trucks up. That's what he said. So my whole thing here with Javon Holland is I truly think this could go Christian Wilkins. I was I, just going to say I, that. I was literally going to say those exact words. Yeah. It so, feels like that a little bit. It does. Yeah. I don't think but, this is a slam dunk as people might think. But that, but that also, to, to those who are going to get worried and panicked, that means we could easily slap a franchise tag on them yeah. after this year and have control over them 
for one more time. So I, yeah. I don't, I don't think it means end of the world. I, I do no, think no, no. though that like it, it's going to be an interesting thing. Like Holland has been a gem of a find for where we found him. I would say that he's been very good here. I, I would after the start his rookie year though. I will say that like I've come away expecting a little bit more. Uh, you know, I, I just have. The problem like, is I, Anthony Weaver. Look at what Weaver and that defense did for Kyle Hamilton. Oh, I, I if it does that for Javon Holland, we're going to all see the big step we all thought he was going to take under Fangio. Right, and there's going to be a huge domino, I think, that hits here in the next two weeks, and that's going to be the Antoine Winfield contract. I think that's going to get done. We'll see that price tag. See, and, and Miami should do this. I see Devontae Smith is, is discussed with the Eagles. You got to start getting these deals with Waddle, Waddle yeah. and Holland Phillips, done, man. Yeah. And I think I think Phillips is good to slap the fifth year option on coming back of an injury. I'm okay with kind of playing it safe there, but for Holland and Waddle, man, that price tag is just getting more expensive by the day. Sure. And and teams like the Eagles that are going to get business done, like you, you could get Waddle for the best value if you got the deal done now, and yeah. it would create great flexibility for this you know off season and seasons beyond but like it's i hate like that you know that I, I hate to say it but like they got bigger fish to fry right now because they have to iron out this to a deal first and foremost before they turn their attention to anything else because that money and how they structure it then they'll know how to structure deals next right like it's you can, if they go and pay waddle and holland now then it's like, oh, holy shit! How are we got to fit? That's why they it? wanted this two. That's why they wanted this two stuff done by free agency. And what happened? Athletes first. And this is what I've, I've listen. I haven't had a chance to talk to you about this, so I've talked about it already on the channel. What do you do now when your two is camp? They were. I, I heard privately they were waiting to see Dax money come through. Now Dallas has come out and said we're not paying. And you know what? They're waiting. They're waiting for him to hit that sixty to sixty-five mark, so they would come in at fifty-five to fifty-eight probably and say, "Well, if Dak's getting sixty, we should be getting fifty-five or more." You know that's what the play was going to uh -huh. be. Now you back yourself into a corner where that contract isn't hitting. So. What what's gonna happen? Because I'm gonna tell you right now, people keep saying, "Well, play on the fifth year, play on the fifth year." I'm gonna tell you, everyone, right now, the Miami Dolphins do not want a franchise tag situation with Tua. They don't. No, they don't no, want no, 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 They no, don't no. want to. They don't want to go down that path. So, what do you do now? Like, if like that's the thing, Neil did. Athletes first put themselves in a precarious predicament because Dak didn't get paid like they thought they would, and the reset didn't happen. Now, what do you do? Well, two weeks ago, I said I would have said it's crazy to think that a deal doesn't get done by the start of the season. I still think the deal's going to get done by the start of the season, but it doesn't seem as crazy that it wouldn't at this point. And and, and this is the agents, man, of, of the game, and this is the business of football rearing its ugly head. Like, I'm sure that even two is like, let's get this deal done. I want security. And, and, and you know why you should be getting it done if you're the Dolphins? This, the, 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 Cap is going to go up at least another thirty million next year. Right. So y'all, y'all are scoffing at fifty, fifty-five next year. What do you think the number is going to be next year when it goes up thirty million? And then if you franchise tag them, the next year it's projected to go up again. We're projected to be around three hundred fifty-five million over the next three years. Yeah, I, I think I think fifty-two and a half gets it done right now, man. And it's a lot of money. I'm not going to say it's not, but this is this is the biggest supply and demand position in all of sports man if you don't have a quarterback it's over it's over right like it's over i, I like I, I like i i and i also think it's really good for the dolphins to get the deal done get the cap yeah. savings add it to the june first money and have the ability to carry it over i, I think those are there's various situations so I, yeah. i'm hopeful man and and i think it's you know probably june-ish when it yeah. does come to fruition but man it's hard not to be impatient when this you know the talks have been going and and they're not stalemate at this time, but it doesn't seem like there's a lot of progress. Yeah. Listen, all I'll say to wrap this up is if you sign him for 55 million right now and it, the projection continues of over 90 million over the next three years and we get to about 355 million, by that time, he's only taken up about 15 and a half percent of the cap, not even 20 percent of the cap. So, right. Sure. In the short term, people might, eh, but it's a long term play. You Ladies, yep, you so, gotta get it. You gotta get it done. You got to. Yeah, yeah, you there's, have to. There's yeah, nothing you else you can to. do at this point. Yeah. So just like you said, you got to know where you're going in the future here. So, ladies and gentlemen, please hit me with a like. 
If you are new here, hit us with a subscribe. Appreciate all y'all coming through. Neil's got to go get inducted into his high school hall of fame. Nominated. I gotta go eat, nominated. Oh, nominated. Sorry, nominated. I got to go eat some barbecue. So shout out to each and every one of you. Smash the like button. Subscribe if you're new. We appreciate all of you coming through. We had over between um, Twitter and YouTube. We had over a thousand people watching today. So thank you very much. And guys, I'll see you on the next one. Until then, you already know what time it is. Fins up all day, every day. Have a fantastic rest of your Thursday, people.